Wow, wow, wow. Balin is now my favorite new character. This cliffhanger is just killing me. Episode 7 stars with soft, ethereal music, which reminded me a lot of the opening score of The Phantom Menace. A lot of prequel vibes here. Indeed, we see that we are somewhat correct opening on a spectacular shot of Coruscant during daytime and the new Senate Chamber building. Cool seeing the landing platforms of Phantom Menace also. I got super nostalgic vibes from the first scene. We cut inside the chambers where Hera is being scolded by Senator Ziono, who seems to be the tool of the bunch. Aesthetically, the New Republic seems to have decorated as light bland as possible. Everything is kind of shiny. Anyway, Ziono is accusing Hera of using New Republic resources for personal reasons and disobeying direct orders. For me, watching this scene is pretty obvious that this guy is an Imperial plant. Similar to Elia Kane, he is working secretly for the Shadow Council and awaiting the return of Thrawn. Plus, the open disdain that Hera has for Ziono continues, and Chancellor Mothma seems to secretly enjoy it. This is the first we see Mothma in her official capacity for real. Previously, we only saw her in hologram. And Captain Tava arrives, and very shortly after that, a very unexpected cameo. A cameo that I didn't know I wanted happens, which is a very pleasant surprise to see 3PO again. It's funny that Filoni made 3PO arrogant kinda now, telling the guard that he doesn't need to show identification. He all but said, do you know who the hell I am? If you missed it, it's a sneaky reference to the Ben Kenobi mind trick he did on the Stormtrooper in A New Hope. Let me see your identification. You don't need to see his identification. Greg Daniels is voicing 3PO as per usual, still sounding great, I might add, and he informs the council that this mission was approved by Leia Organa. Now, in the novel, we know that Leia falls from grace when the New Republic finds out Vader was her father. It seems that that hasn't happened yet. Charges are dismissed after 3PO saves the day, but Mothma is made aware that the Thrawn threat is very, very real, although so far falling on deaf ears. We get the title screen, episode 7, is called Dreams and Madness. I think it'll become apparent who this is referring to later on. It opens on the Purgles still traveling and actually communicating with, with each other. During light speed, we hear silent calls. Ahsoka training hard. She is going to be facing Balin again, but above her, we see that the holo projector is on. Then slowly moving into frame is a holo projection of Anakin with his Clone Wars armor on, meaning this was recorded around the same time we see him and young Ahsoka fight on Ryloth in episode 5. During the flashbacks, not only do we get much of the missing dialogue we heard Anakin say during the trailer about Ahsoka not fighting just droids in this war, but we get mentions of General Grievous, Count Dooku, which Anakin fought, but the biggest name drop yet was Asajj Ventress. In Legends, we actually see that Asajj was the one that gave Anakin that scar on the right eye. We learned that this was one of the many recordings that Anakin had made for for Ahsoka and that she knows it by heart. Ahsoka tells Hu Yang that this was the last recording Anakin made and that he was a good master. Echoing again, Ben Kenobi telling Luke that Anakin was a good friend. After finally arriving on Peridia, they soon find themselves under attack. Thrawn had rigged the planet around with mines who pursue approaching targets until making contact and exploding. It was funny to see how Hu Yang is not satisfied with using Purgal only as transport, but he wants to use them as shields as well. When the Purgal are gone, Ahsoka and Hu Yang make it out of the minefield, but new fighters from the Eye of Sion force them to retreat to the graveyard. Now Enoch confirms the arrival of Ahsoka through the Purgles. Back in episode 6, Thrawn wanted to know everything about Ahsoka to be prepared, and I really thought we were going to get a lot, lot more details in canon, but we only see Thrawn find out that in fact General Anakin Skywalker was her former master. It is at this moment that you could see his mind working in real time. He immediately deduces how to proceed next. Although as we see later, I don't think he has fooled Ahsoka as much as it was made out to be. Ezra seems to be working out great in live action, man. Honestly, he had such little time in episode 6, but now that we've had more time, I can definitely feel this guy's energy and this guy's character. There are great references in his talk with Sabine too. The Battle of Endor, where the Emperor was killed. I like how Sabine adds, 
Well, that's what people are saying. I think Dave, when he wrote that, was contemplating actually writing that Sabine looks at the camera while she says that, because in the end, of course, we know the Emperor returns. So, great wink wink by Sabine there. We learn also Zeb is training recruits, but the greatest moment from Ezra comes when he laughs at the notion that Ahsoka trains Sabine. This is the moment I really thought Ezra is back. The actor really got the playful nature of Rebels Ezra, and here's hoping for a great episode 8, where hopefully we see a more greater Jedi Ezra too. The power of Force Bond makes an appearance on this episode too. Ahsoka uses it to talk to Sabine, and while the connection is faint, she at the very least finds out where Ezra and Sabine are located down on the planet. But we finally get a direct collaboration between Thrawn and the Great Mothers, per the instructions of Thrawn. They used their magic. The way they were able to find Ahsoka was pretty apparent and kind of shocking. I don't know if you guys picked it up, but canon was just changed again and added to it. While Ahsoka was using Force Bond, the Great Mothers intercepted the connection. So this is pretty fascinating. As previously, we have treated Night Sister magic and the Force as separate energies. However, now we can deduce by this that they both come from the same ethereal force. Somewhere, somehow, they intersect. Both magic and the force are one and the same. This is how the Great Mothers were able to sense where Ahsoka was. Very, very fascinating. I love that with each passing Ahsoka episode, there's constantly new bombshells for canon lore. Down on the planet, though, even though Sabine felt something, now they see Balin and Shin waiting for them up on a hill. The raiders are right behind. We see that they have joined forces. This is, I think, the moment that defines Balin's skull. And this is the moment where I think we should all praise Ray Stevenson for being just the one of the greatest characters in Star Wars. I've constantly been saying this over and over, but I don't think we're going to get a character like Balin for a long, long time. Before this series, we only got him in the trailers and he seemed like a good villain but nothing really special and after watching these episodes you really get the feeling of how Ray Stevenson was able to, to pull this off and I said it in my reaction in my first reaction video but it's sad to know that Ray Stevenson now is dead we get a hint from this episode that he actually might be coming back for season two of Ahsoka he might not die here so if he doesn't do that then I don't know how they will achieve bringing him back maybe recast him with another actor i would not like that but tell me all your thoughts down below and the sheer fact that he recognizes the greed and ambition of his apprentice shin and actually lets her go knowing full well that she won't come with him on this journey. Balin has to take his own journey, and Shin is just not ready. He's a man of his word. He tells Shin to inform Thrawn that he has found Ezra, and finally, before leaving, he gives her one last lesson. Impatience for victory will guarantee defeat. If this is the last time Balin sees Shin Hadi, then I think that pretty much this has been a great duo to present for Ahsoka. Both Shin is very enticing and you can see a dark brooding character but a naive one as well and she is essentially a dark version of Luke in A New Hope and you also see the great master that is Balin's skull he does not compromise his words he does not compromise his stances he is not vengeful toward Shin that she wants to pursue her own goals outside of him so he just lets her go. And that's really rare in these characters where they're constantly jealous or biting for territory. Balin is simply not built like that. What's even more fascinating is Balin did something that not a lot if any people have been able to achieve, and that is completely fool Thrawn in his own element. Thrawn was expecting Balin to join the battle. He had no idea that once he realized that Balin was gone, he sees that that particular battle was to be lost. He had already calculated Balin's involvement in, 
Now that he is not there, it was a surefire loss. Last episode, aboard the Chimera, we got to see the TIE Fighters. Now we see the LAAT, or the LAT, patrol gunships. The Nodi continue to be great little characters who we see as completely defenseless, although they're not without their wit, as the Raiders are pushing ahead and trying to intercept Ezra and Sabine. We get the rematch that we've all deserved in this series. Again, it is Balin versus Ahsoka. This time around, Ahsoka has fully prepped for him. And although in the last match, Ahsoka was injured and distracted, but when she thought Sabine had died, this time she was fully prepared, and yet she still lost, which was very shocking and unexpected. You clearly see how powerful Balin really is in this match. There's a moment where he uses the Anakin technique with his lightsaber. He kind of pushes her. But as I said, time Time is kind of the theme of this episode. Later, we realize that Thrawn is only biding his time. He doesn't actually want to kill Ahsoka or Sabine or anybody. If that is not the end result, then by the time they fight each other down on the ground, he will have been able to load up his cargo and just leave this forsaken planet, as he says. But Ahsoka actually tells Balin before they start dueling, I don't have time for this. So expect great things in episode 8 because I don't think Thrawn has everybody fooled. I think Ahsoka is one step ahead and knows what Thrawn is actually planning. So something is about to take place that we are not yet made aware of. Hu Yang intervenes with Ahsoka's starship and distracts Balin while Ahsoka grabs his ride and goes to save Sabine and Ezra. This was a beautiful moment from Balin's skull. And again, Ray Stevenson is just on top of things. So great. He gives a smirk as if being glad that he didn't have to kill Ahsoka. As we remember in episode 2, he was very dismissal of the idea of killing more Jedi. So, in the end, I think Balin went off very satisfied of the outcome. That even though as he leaves for his own mission, which... I mean, speculation galore. We talked about a lot during this week about what Balin's plans are actually about. And perhaps, as we've discussed, I mean, it could be a lot. It could be the Bendu, or it could be actually Abeloth the mother of Mortis, who may have been calling to him because she has been trapped or imprisoned on this planet. There is a reason, as we see in episode 6, that everybody wants to leave this forsaken place. There's something brewing here that we have still yet to see. Sabine and Ezra go against Shin and the Raiders. So Shin Hari is still a formidable opponent. We clearly see that. We get the Night Troopers too. And there's a moment there where we see Ezra has kind of become weak and wary, similar to how Obi-Wan had been weakened by him not using the Force and being cut off from it. Because Shin Force pushes him so bad at one point that he nearly broke his back. Although without his lightsaber, he was he was able to avoid her strikes and using moves like Darth Vader too. So that was interesting, a hint of dark there. But in the end, it all comes collapsing down because, because Thrawn realizes that Balin has abandoned them. Doesn't see the necessity of actually wasting more resources and more stormtroopers just to fight this trio now that Ahsoka finally finds them and they are reunited. So everybody is called back and Shin is left to her own devices all alone. We still see the goodness in Ahsoka. She actually tries to save her, but this time around, it's just not happening. I perhaps see Shin relenting in the end, but right now is she is just still too conflicted, which she shows by actually running away. So all in all, it was beautiful to see the reunion again. Ahsoka actually showing emotion. She laughed while she hugged Ezra. And the last line before the episode ends, I think I might be going home after all. This is said by Ezra. Uh, kind of a hint of what's to expect, we should expect from episode eight. I honestly don't know how this is going to happen. The Chimera is too big for Ahsoka and Thrawn. Ron, so somebody is going to need to relent or they're all going to be stuck here. So yeah, we're going to talk about a whole lot more during the week. So be sure to subscribe and thank you guys so much.